Hello, I'm Kylie Whitehead. Welcome to the Poly AI podcast. Um, I'm joined today by Poly AI's head of machine learning, Pavel Budzianaski. Hi, Pavel. Hey, Kylie. How's it going? Yeah, good. How are you? Bad. Excited about our new topic, which we, which we talked about a little bit before on the other end of it, which is voice generation. Yeah, exactly. So in episode six, a few episodes ago, um, Pavel and I spoke about speech recognition. And like Pavel just said, we're back here today to talk a little bit about voice generation. And Pavel, just to set the context here, we've all seen films like Spike Jones's Her, right, where the AI has this incredibly realistic um, voice to the point where Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with it. Um, but then I speak to Siri or I speak to Alexa and it still just sounds like a robot, right? I'm not going to fall in love with Siri or Alexa. They're, they're pretty boring. Sorry. <laughs> um, and there are thousands of people working on those voice assistants, right? Um, and I really want to use today to get to the bottom of why they still sound like that um, and what, what we're going to do to make them better. So maybe um, to kick us off, you could talk about the, the really early history of voice generation, because I, I think it, it goes pretty far back, right? Yeah, yep. Just as, as with automatic speech recognition, machine translation, again, historically speaking, all started in, in, in deep 1950s. Um, a lot of army projects, a lot of DARPA style like projects was about um, imitating, imitating human beings. And part of that was uh, ability to create human like speech. Um, you can trace back early experiments, even earlier to like 18th century, 19th century, where um, people physically were generating some um, sounds, um, just like human, uh, just like normal instruments, right? They were trying to mimic um, human, um, human voices. Uh, but uh, as again, with uh, machine translation or automatic speech recognition, IBM led their um, way in early 50s, uh, where it was creating first so-called vocoders, which actually uh, still exist and still part of all of these really nasty stuff that you hear uh, sometimes in Siri or Alexa. But not not long we're going to get that uh, to that problem um, soon. So uh, 50s is definitely like the the early the early stage of these systems. Then the 60s, 70s. Um, folks were working on improving that to the point that uh, I think it's worth mentioning here, uh, uh, which is the space of the say, right, 2001, where that was highlighted uh, quite visibly. Yeah, I am. Um, so apparently Arthur C. Clarke, when he, when he was writing 2001, um, he visited Bell Labs and he saw a demonstration of their vocoder and it was singing the song um, Daisy Bell, which is how 2001 yeah. ends. Um, so he was so impressed and, and wrote that in, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, you mentioned vocoder then, right? And so vocoder yeah. goes a really long way back. I remember a few months ago, um, you wrote me a really great blog post about um, scaling the universal vocoder. Yeah. And like, what has changed? Are you telling me that you're using the same technology now that yeah. they were using in the 50s? Yeah. So... It, the early experiments and the early models that are almost can be traced to late 2000s, um, essentially, they're, everything there evolved around the vocoder, the early idea of the vocoder, where you had the units of speech, just like with automatic speech recognition, uh, we call them phonemes, um, that are our heuristics to, uh, to simplify the problem of, uh, of human, um, human voice where you have parts of the speech that we need to utter. And the whole job of vocoder was to concatenate these parts of the speech, these phonemes, and make the sounds as similar as possible to the human beings. Now, uh, once, once you define the tool like that, immediately you're going to run into the problems because uh, you concatenating all of the words, all of the sentences in like small uh, units, and you're just trying then them uh, concatenate them together. Now, by definition, um, this will not sound natural and you would have a four years of a lot of work, a lot of PhDs, a lot of papers, a lot of even companies trying to make this sound a little bit better to the point that, you know, you had these early Google uh, speech synthesis or uh, Siri or Alexa that got us to the point that it was intelligible. Um, you know, you clearly, you, you've, you understood 
um, when Siri was telling you about the, about the address um, or um, direction, but definitely wasn't pleasing, right? Um, so this early stage vocoders was essentially getting the, the phonemes, concatenating together and creating the audio out of it. Um, then as always, neural networks comes in, right? Um, come in and uh, they kind of flip the table, right? As you can observe in automatic speech recognition around 2010, 2012, with speech synthesis, it was a little bit better uh, later, it was around 2015, you start to see early traces of people sort of applying deep learning um, to Texas speech synthesis as previously um, called the whole field. Now it's moving into the voice generation um, nomenclature where um, we are giving the neural network freedom to generate the whole word or even the whole sentence at once, right? And by definition, that will introduce a great leap in terms of the, in terms of the quality. So when I wrote about the vocoder in 2023, it's slightly different vocoder than it was 2000 and now one. 1,970 1, in, two, in 2001 Space Odyssey. There's so many numbers I'm getting lost into it. <laughs> um, but what's the most important bit that um, since last couple of years, we stopped chunking the speech and we start generating the full sentence in the words. Right, that makes sense. But I, I still feel like in a lot of applications, because of the way the speech is being concatenated, you... Yeah it still doesn't sound like you would say a sentence, right? So I would say um, like Friday the 13th. Um, but when you hear these systems, they say Friday the 13th. Like, yeah. why, does it, why does it still sound like that? Got you. Um, part, of the, part of the issue is that a lot of systems still exist uh, and work on um, old, old systems that not really um, using deep, uh, deep learning even in 2023. So that could be one of the issues when you hear it on the bus or in the underground. Um, I can assure you that probably the code goes back into uh, times where we weren't even born. Um, so that will be swept away, I'm telling you, in a couple of months because um, that's how easy it will be to implement these systems. The other, uh, the other problem, if the system already works on the deep learning um, architectures, are coming from the lack of context. And here we go back to the, you know, everything that poly AI stands um, for, which is, it's really hard if you think about, if you think, if you were asked actually to mimic somebody's uh, voice and out of the blue, you know, you're required to say specific sentence, which is, um, you know, um, announce that the bus is coming at, uh, at one o'clock um, and you're sorry for delays, right? Without knowing what country you're in, um, uh, how long already the bus was delayed, right? Um, all sorts of the questions that are part of the context, you would be just doing a guessing game how you should utter the sentence. And that's what the models are doing these days. They do not have that context. So they average out all possible um, things, um, all possible ways to say that particular sentence and just making the best guess. Yeah, that's. That's really interesting. We, um, so obviously at Poly AI currently, like as of, you know, this moment, we're using a combination, right, of synthesized voices and voice yep. actors where we are doing a bit of concatenation to put those together. But when we first started working with voice actors, I remember that they would record, they would see the script of what we wanted them to record and they would say it in that IVR voice. They'd, they'd be like, thank you for calling company name. How can yeah. I help? And and it's taken a lot, even just to train people, that that, that isn't like the most natural way to sound. Yeah. It just, it seems very neutral. It's like yeah. we almost learned from machines how professionals mm -hmm. should talk. And now we're trying to undo that and make it people-led yeah. again, right? Really yeah. natural. Yeah. Um, so so no, the, there, is, there is a lot of issues uh, that are not visible um, to, to people who are not practicing the deep learning uh, field, and one of them is very trivial. Something that is obvious when you're thinking about large language models or ASR is the amount of data. So text-to-speech voice generation um, historically has been deprived of that data. Uh, first of all, um, people tend to 
in um be pretty close also mentally when it comes to like proprietary of their voice right that's a part of your of your identity so um most of folks and i'm including myself would be pretty reluctant right if you would tell them that you know give me your voice for a couple of dollars and you're going to be you know we're going to copy that um and you're going to be heard all over the world right that's something that um is not as easy as, as telling you that record your speech and we are trying to understand you right that's whole different spectrum so because of these um because of these reasons we've while the models in 2022 uh, automatic speech recognition models were trained on 100,000 of hours, the state of the art models, either in production or in research, um, in voice generation was, were trained on 500 hours at best. So you see the huge difference, right? And as we know, um, um, and probably kids are being taught this in kindergarten these days, right? Neural networks need more data, right? So only only last couple of months, and I can see it if you like open up our research uh, research forums and boards, um, you can start to see the models that were able to train from vast majority um, of the internet data to mimic conversational um, conversational way of, of human uh, talking to each other like podcasts or YouTube videos. Um, and historically, it was really hard for us to train uh, with that noisy data, the models that were uh, that were kind of asked to uh, generate the voice that is not noisy, right? So you have this issue where uh, I'm giving you as an input very noisy um, conversational data like podcasts or data like like we are having right now, um, and then you're asked to generate something very clean, right? That's that's by definition creates confusions, and for a lot of years. We had just failed with uh, with training with this data, and that left us with some voice recording of actors, as I told you, 500 hours of data that were our typical benchmarks. And you see the wave of new research coming in last couple of months, like I would say a year, highlighting with Vali uh, from Microsoft. I think that was one of the models that really hit the news, where you could um, basically clone your voice with five seconds of your right input data that really blew people away. But um, what was what was the most important part about that model wasn't the, you know any new architecture. It was just classic architecture that we use with large language models. But uh, they train on 60,000 hours of data uh, as a base model. So you see the, the, you know, the, the jump. Um, you see the jump in terms of amount of data that they had and hence the quality. Yep. You... You were speaking earlier about context as well, which I think, you know, you speak very differently. I'm thinking of an example of one of our deployments where it's for a restaurant group um, and it answers the phone like you'd expect a person to answer the phone. Hello. Um, and, yeah. you know, and um, how do you sort of get that context into yeah. voice data? Like it's so... Yeah. You know, the context of being able to understand is one thing, but then adding on that other layer of emotional cues, how you how you change the yeah. the way the voice is inflected and, and what that actually sounds like yeah. feels I, quite difficult to define. I appreciate that you're asking the questions that I was waiting since the beginning of that podcast, because that's one of the most exciting uh, parts uh, of my day day to day work, which is essentially contextualizing you know, text to speech um, and voice generation. What you will observe, and you 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 can get some hints from uh from uh from the demos that you see online, uh or even live project uh, products uh, from some companies, is that the wave of conversational uh, voice generation is coming, and um, the way we're gonna do it is basically adapting the architectures that we have for a single speaker, where you were given a text, uh, right to say, um, and some. Uh, context of this um, this speaker voice, um, and we will transform it in a conversational setup where the training data, uh, to put it naively, will be uh, two blocks. One is person one uh, A, per, and the second block will be person B. And essentially, um, the model will see the turn before your answer, right? So it, you can see straight away that in terms of the text generation in the example that you were given, if I'm going to call uh, a restaurant and I'll say, hi, how's going on? I'm Pavel, I'm looking for a table for tonight, right? 
this will be all inputs to the model. Uh, along with all of the data that the model had about the voice that it needs to generate. So this combined will give you the full information that you need in order to say, hello, Pavel, how are you? How can I help you? Unfortunately, we don't have any tables tonight, right? Which is, um, which is a completely different setup that we have right now, which is just a text. Unfortunately, we don't have a table tonight that will be said in a flat average um, a voice. And as I was, you know, stitching puzzles together, if you think about um, what's happening right now and which you will observe soon in, in the production and that we are working as well in poly AI is that we start to have conversational data. You know, people love podcasts. You know, we are a good example of that. So there is more and more um, data out there uh, where two people converse or even more. We learn how to train models from that noisy environment. We have architectures, which are deep neural networks. Um, they are so-called transformer. When you put these things together, right, uh, magic will happen. Uh, you can already see some demos out there. I'm not going to name some of the big companies doing that, um, where you start seeing this early traces of, of just mind blowing, um, mind blowing conversational, uh, examples. Um, and you know, you soon going to be probably living in a reality where you might call your mom and she might be busy cooking, um, yeah. And you know, should that will be like AI assistant answering all of your, um, all of your questions. I hopefully, hopefully that don't gonna be the case. But, you know, I'm expecting my mom to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's so creepy. Um, it's surely when you have that uh, huge pot of data, like if you combine my voice with your voice, you're gonna get a really weird voice. Um, that's hundred so percent true. <laughs> so what happens when you have that that like really big data set how does it kind of average out because it's so personal right voice is so yeah. it's so much yeah. more personal than text or, or anything else got it so from the modeling perspective the model um the models that we are training they always have this part that um that are called speaker embeddings and as an input to the model, except for the text or for the context of the conversation, you're also giving a, um, a sample of your speech. Um, and this will be, uh, this will be transformed into so-called vector embedding. So this vector of numbers that will specify that I want to generate voice with that specific, specific, um, qualities. And because throughout the training, um, the model observe, I don't know. 100,000 speakers, uh, they will learn that, um, given, given these speaker embedding, um, thinking about, um, you know, female voice age from 20 to 30, um, um, you know, having a, a, let's say British or, um, old Welsh accent, uh, you know, <laughs> let's be diplomatic here. Um, and this signal would be way different than a uh, male 20 to 40 right um having some um some non-native accent and giving this embedding the model will learn and know how to generate the right right quality of voice and then in terms of of responding emotionally you did talk about this a bit earlier but i you you mentioned that it would be sort of looking at the previous turn in the conversation so if i'm really angry if i sound yeah. angry it will be able to adjust its voice to be maybe more accommodating whereas if i'm excited it can be excited with me yes that's 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 already happening um yeah. you have models that uh given the sample of your voice that are is happy it will copy that happiness now that's a little bit different than what we really want which is uh, contextually, contextually, uh, smart, right? So if the, my interlocutor is happy, then I should be happy as well. Right. Rather than just artificially, like putting some happy input and getting happy output. Cause you can imagine really bad, uh, experience, um, in terms of, I don't know, uh, poly AI deployments where, you know, somebody said something really sad, but we put some happy, uh, sample, right. Then you have this confusion. Um, and then, you know, the, the person on the phone will be like, what the hell, right? So, um, so we're not there yet, but it's clear that it's coming that the true, um, true contextuality, um, will happen. Um, and it's, I would say it's just a matter of a couple months. Yeah. yeah. That's really exciting. I think it opens a lot of doors when you think about, um, 
the context of mirroring in psychology, where perhaps the voice assistant can kind of adapt to the speaker's tone. And that is something that's meant to put the other person in the conversation at ease, right? Yes. Um, which will be very interesting to see how that's applied in like sales situations and other situations where maybe it's a little bit um, ethically blurry, but yeah. should be interesting to watch. 100%, 100%. I think it would be worth uh, of us adding later on under under um, the website of our podcast, maybe some samples that we're already having um, in live productions, right? With this generative voices through already mind blowing. And I'm, I'm yeah. really excited what's going to happen. You know, when we're going to increase our neural networks, um, add more data, add more context, it's just going to get better, which means better UX for the customers. Yeah. I think we've, so we've both been at Poly AI for like five years now, right? And it, yeah. It really feels to me that the last year, so much more has changed than had changed in those four years before that, right? Yeah. Like we, yeah. we didn't have a choice but to use voice actors because synthesized voices just were not good. And then all of a sudden, wow, synthesized voices are, are pretty good now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that all because of generative? Yes. Yeah. It's it, the wave of generative AI. As if, uh, as if that's a simple answer, but also the true answer. Um, it, it was just like this tipping point of uh, increasing our knowledge, how neural networks work, how data is important. And as I told you, right, we, we had a lot of fights um, as a research community with this noisy data that we have, uh, we've overcome with better architecture or architectures that allows us to like make this the sleep that, that you can hear and experience you know, when you call, call our production systems. Yeah, cool. And it's not just the the voice itself, right? Like we've we've spoken about the way that the voice sounds and voice generation, but also the the actual words that are being generated allows you to add that extra layer of conversationalness to the conversation, right? Because at the moment, using the intent based models, you're sort of pulling a pre written utterance back, yeah, and you have to just keep repeating it or but a generative model can sort of make things up on the fly in the way that a yeah. person would. Absolutely. So as you see, like this whole technology stacks adds things up together into a really nice puzzle. So, you know, uh, starting from automatic speech recognition, better and better understanding the contextuality of the answers with large language models, where, as you said, it's not about retrieving the best answer, but really generating every word um, as close and as specific that you need to be uh, given the question of the user. And then given that um, highly adapted answer to specific problem, you're going to generate highly uh, contextual um, speech that will, that, will truly, um, that will truly make the whole UX much, much better. Because um, let's be honest, um, no matter how smart my ASR system will be, no matter how big and smart my large language model will be, a lot of times I got to say uh, in the last couple of years, like most of people were saying that the system is dumb or smart, depending on the voice quality. It's a huge factor. Uh, it's, I would say, uh, by far the, the biggest uh, in terms of the, how people rec receive, you know, receive and, and, and feel um, when they're talking to the system. So um, that all finally comes together and I'm super excited uh, where things are going to go. Um, even like going a couple of years ahead, um, excuse me for the, for the research anecdotes, but you can already, um, see some people trying and we are actively discussing this in our community of building models that will be truly speech to speech. Um, Facebook, sir, for example, um, created literally a couple of weeks ago, both data set and first models that I gotta say suck, but, uh, they will, I'm sure they will be good at some point where uh, essentially we're going to transform from you talking to me uh, and the system will be outputting in one go a speech rather than dividing into like simple, uh, simple, not simple, but uh, specific models. And that will be like another step into, uh, into um, improving the speed and quality of a role. But that's, you know, uh, that's the story of the future. But you see how the whole field is just moving uh, on fast forward speed. Is speech to speech then going to kill like voice biometrics? I would say so. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if I, I can just generate cool. your voice. Yeah. 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 
Scale, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one thing. The other thing is that, you know, it might kill large language models if you think about it, right? Because like, why do, why do we care about text in some um, applications if we, we care about speech? Like imagine like you're driving, right? You should never be looking at the text or like trying to yeah. some text. It will be all. It should always be always be like just speech to speech um, um, interactions. Um, you know, it's it's really hard to foresee what's going to happen in the future given given the the speed ups. But yeah. um, I can tell you one thing: um, the quality of it it's going so uh, it's 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 improving so much that I would say by two thousand twenty four by the end of two thousand twenty four. You're gonna have a really hard time telling whether you're talking to a human being or not. Yeah, I think that's gonna open up a lot of very interesting questions that I'm sure we'll keep covering on the podcast. So um I think we'll wrap it up there. You can listen to previous episodes of the podcast on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and you can find us on LinkedIn for all of our latest news and updates. So once again, Pavel, thank you so much for joining me today, taking the time to explain. Very complicated, but very interesting technology. Pleasure. Um, and until next time, goodbye.